Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us in our webinar on uh, the topic of behavioral science and climate and our continued discussions on the application of behavioral science across the UN system. So for those of you who are new to our webinars, my name is Mary McLennan, and I lead what's called the UN Behavioral Science Group, which is an initiative of the UN Innovation Network and supported by the Executive Office of the Secretary General. So uh, what we do is we aim to bring together over 800 UN colleagues from across the UN system uh, ranging from over 60 UN entities in 110 countries, so quite a lot of individuals. And we do this to, to really in a variety of ways. So I'm just going to put in the chat here um, a, a, some of the documents that we've produced to give you a better sense of what, we, what we've done so far. Um, just want to draw your attention to a few of them. So um, at first, the UN Secretary General's guidance note on behavioral science and some of the efforts of the UN Behavioral Science Week. Uh, and the UN Secretary General's got behavioral science report. Um, so essentially, uh, these documents are produced by the UN Behavioral Science Group and really highlight some of the efforts that have been ongoing across the UN system. Uh, if you haven't joined already the UN Behavioral Science Group, I encourage you to do so. We're currently a collection of over 800 UN colleagues, as I mentioned. Um, there are opportunities to share knowledge, learning, up and learning, um, as well as to collaborate across the UN system. Uh, if you're not part of the UN, there's also very much opportunity for you to join as well uh, in an observer role. We have colleagues from governments, international organizations outside the UN system, academia, civil society, as well as the private sector. And we send out a newsletter every few months or so, so you have the opportunity to really engage with us through, through that method. But if you'd like more interaction and more real-time updates on what's happening across the UN system, I encourage you to follow us on Twitter at UN underscore BSI and the UN Innovation Network, um, which is UN underscore innovation for, for broader innovation work across the UN system. If you have questions about the group or who we are, feel free to put them in the chat or to contact myself and my colleague, Johanna, who runs the UN Innovation Network more broadly. Okay, so in terms of the webinar today, we'll hear from two speakers, and then we'll have about half an hour for questions and answers. So we have lots of opportunity to engage with our panelists today. Uh, we encourage you to put your questions in the Q and A box at the bottom of the screen. So um, there, you can ask whatever question you'd like, as well as have the opportunity to upvote the questions of your colleagues. So if you don't have one yourself, I encourage you to upvote um, to really ensure that we have a discussion that's relevant and meaningful to colleagues in the audience today. Now on to our panelists for today. So as mentioned, the topic is climate and behavioral science. And just to back up a bit in terms of some of the work we've done in the UN system, we carried out a survey of over 25 UN entities and climate was ranked in the top five areas of opportunity for the UN in terms of application of behavioral science. We've also seen efforts already in the UN system thinking about reducing, uh, increasing sustainable consumption and also reducing overfishing. So with climate change being one of the most pressing issues in, in our society today, as well as this increasing application of behavioral science and really the work of the UN that's, that's sort of spoken to this already, um, we're well poised with our panelists today to explore this issue in more detail. So first we'll hear from Lucia Reich, who's the Cambridge University Elarian Professor of Behavioral Economics and Policy. And she'll talk to you some of the ways we can think about applying behavioral science to address climate issues more broadly, potential and possibilities for us in this area. Uh, and then we'll hear from Mari Nishimura from the UN Environment Program, who will speak to the Little Green Book of Nudgers, which is pretty well known in the behavioral science community as an application of behavioral science in this space. And she'll also talk to some of the real world application that they've, that's been carried out with university campuses around the world. So with that, I will turn it over to Lucia, over to you. Yes, hello, hello. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Thanks for having me. This is really exciting to be on this panel and to talk with you today on behavioral insights and climate. So let me share my screen. Oh, it's already there. Okay. Does that work? Can you can you see it? Yes. yes, it tells me participants can see. Okay, here we go. So I think when we talk about what behavioral science, behavioral insights can do uh, to help fight climate change, I think it makes a lot of sense to start with understanding what we actually need to do. <clears throat> and I think a very good first question just to, to grasp 
about you know the kind of the size uh, and also uh, um, the width, so to speak, of the policy problem is to understand what it actually is when we say one ton of carbon. So at the COP26, uh, and we heard uh, if we want to stay below two degrees, we have to uh, reduce about 40 gigatons of carbon. That is, these are huge numbers. But what does that mean for the individual? And behavioral insights based policies are usually targeted to the individual or to groups. And so I think it's really important to get a better understanding. And what I try to do is to make it very blunt and to pick 10 consumer behaviors, 10 consumer decisions, and kind of show what one ton of carbon actually means. And why is that important? It's important because that at the same time tells us where are the most impactful behaviors. And it also tells us what are the behavior changes that we should if possible, start with, and what does it do? So I'm not going to go through all of them, but, you know, aviation kind of one ton of carbon equals one flight from Munich to Tel Aviv, and this is all based on an average German household, or seven years of moderate beef consumption, or two million clicks on the internet, or, and that's something I found surprising. I thought that would be much more 23 years of streaming or only three days in a cruise ship. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm very much aware that there's different ways how to calculate, uh, calculate those, the carbon footprints, but this is pretty much based on what you know today, what to do. So if these are the areas that are up for change, um, how do we actually do that? And luckily, we are not at the very beginning. We're in the middle, and we are also very happy to have an IPCC sixth uh, assessment report upcoming. And uh, on top of this kind of early chapter on demand, the demand side and the policies that can be used actually to uh, mitigate climate change by demand side policies, we also have first um, uh, publications that show us that demand side solutions to climate change mitigation can be pretty consistent with high levels of well-being. And this is, this is a good news, right? Um, when I speak here on demand side solutions, this is of course not only behavioral policies, that's the whole toolbox. But, and this is new, and this is why I am so excited about this new IPCC report, there is a focus on the demand side, and this is, this is still pretty new. So the demand side was not very much in focus in, in the past years. And also there is a kind of, you know, they, they provide a, a very good view on what also specifically behavioral tools can do and cannot do. So we have increasing scientific evidence that it works. Now, what is so specific about um, climate action? Uh, and there are some very specific behavioral barriers. And if we talk about changing behaviors, we have to know a lot about the barriers. And they are, I would say, unfortunately, pretty systemic. So they don't kind of differ a lot between individuals or between countries. So what are they? Uh, present bias and hyperbolic discounting. So we keep talking about you know, future generations. And I think the extreme weather events this year have shown this is actually something that is happening now and not in the future and not only somewhere else. But we know people are pretty hardwired and present bias is strong. Loss aversion, people are more negative about losses than they are positive about probable gains. And interestingly, also politicians try to push the losses into the future, of course, because it's hard to, to gain um, uh, votes with focusing on the losses. Low salience, well, greenhouse gases are invisible and below sensing thresholds. So this is quite a difference to other environmental issues because we're very much used to act on our senses. Then there's also no immediate feedback on the consequences of our behavior. It's kind of, you know, it takes a while uh, and things are complicated. So again, something that makes it difficult to act up, uh, upon our knowledge. There's a lot of 
consumer confusion and misinformation regarding what is the most climate friendly choice. And some of it is unintended, some of it is also purposeful. And then what we what we talk about when we talk about climate attribution or climate change is really probabilistic harms. Uh, we don't know that much. We know more, but attribution science is pretty much at you know its beginning. So we will know more about uh, the consequences, but we should know much more. Then we all know about the extreme polarization, particular in climate change. So 30 years ago, when you would ask a Democrat and a Republican about climate change, you would get more or less the same answers. And today, it's this is unthinkable. And then we have more traditional uh, economic uh, issues, such as free riding on public goods or commons, distrust in others to collectively manage the commons, such as the oceans or the forest. And then also something that is, you know, might, might sound not so relevant, but I think it is. So there is no specific bullion. So there's, it's more or less the results of countless faceless people who conclude, and that makes it difficult to kind of fight back fight back the bullion. And then I think more kind of uh, from an ethical point of view, it's also kind of difficult because there is a lot of kind of legitimate pent up demand in developing countries. So it's too easy to say, let's simply, you know, all kind of consume less. So that doesn't sound very good. However, there are strategies and they are laid out in a very kind of, I think, extensive literature and also in this, uh, in the latest overview and systematic um, um, overviews and reviews uh, that we luckily are getting these days. So what are the strategies? They're actually pretty easy. So we can do better. We can use more efficient, improved products. We can and, and also better have better use strategy of products. Of course, less sufficiency moderation is um, not very popular uh, because it limits economic growth, but we basically know it's not going to go, not going to work without it. Together, collaborative consumption, sharing, pooling, smarter, particular new materials. Uh, I, I think in the bioeconomy, the bioeconomy really provides an immense and uh, very exciting innovations that will help us reduce the carbon impact. And also everything that goes in the direction of personalization, more targeted uh, and data-based and digitally enhanced consumption. Circular economy, circular consumption is a big, big uh, um, win. And also in some cases, prosumerism, so own production or cooperative ownership also can help. Now, what is important is really to I like to call it factor in the behavioral factor, because those are really, this is about not just buying sustainability, but also doing sustainability. And our knowledge on behavioral insights is so relevant to actually make those things happen. Uh, in the language of the IPCC, by the way, those strategies are usually called avoid, shift, and approve. Now, when we talk about changing behaviors again, so uh, we looked at the barriers and we looked at the strategy, it is of absolute uh, relevance and importance also to realize not just the kind of the, the flow of decisions. This is the model here in my upper, upper, upper left. It's a pretty kind of standard model of how consumers actually decide and make decisions and behave. So the idea is to be to have influence with behavioral strategies on all those levels. So improve and ease, you know, um, um, opportunities, but also keep people motivated and also enlarge their capabilities. This might not sound like nudging in a in a very narrow sense, but indeed taking a Take a little bit of broader view. So behavioral insights and behavioral science has can have uh, a deep impact on all three levels. And what is also very relevant is that what people have called the decision cube. So it's not only the individual, but it's of course also the question of how pre-structured is really is the problem. 
So is there a high degree of freedom or can the individual only change, you know, make little changes because there's a lot of path dependency or the infrastructure kind of infrastructure lock in. And this is something to to know uh, when we design our behavioral strategies. Then also, what type of de decision is it? Is it how conscious is it? Is it a lot, is it kind of non-reflected or is it something more kind of system to decision, very much reflected? And that also plays a role. And then finally, how important, how significant is it to for the individual? So for instance, we know that everything around food and health is something that seems to be very close to people, probably also because it's kind of very close to the body and to one's identity. And other consumer behaviors might be less essential. And that, of course, also changes. So it is pretty complex. And uh, here is that I'm sure every one of you knows kind of the Bible, right? So uh, I call it the Bible, which is now out in the second, uh, the second edition. Um, and one of the answers to this highly complex and behaviorally loaded decision is nudging. It's not the only one, um, as we saw. It's like, I think today with climate change, we need all hands on deck, which basically means all tools on deck, but uh, um, behavioral insights is of course, uh, very closely linked to choice architecture and the, um, the idea of nudge. So what do we talk about? And here I can be super short because we're going to have this beautiful little book of green nudges, uh, um, the colleague uh, from UNEP talking after me. So this is kind of just a, the list, what can we do? So I'm very well aware of the Behavioral Insights Team acronym EAST. So Cass and I, we call it FEAST because we think that fun also has to be part of it. Um, fun makes it much more attractive and complex puts people in a completely different mindset, uh, kind, of, kind of away from chores, chores to, uh, well, more, more fun and, and, uh, and entertainment. Maybe it's just, just to mention uh, that, so this little kind of logo up here, the Beacon Project is something I'm currently trying to do with the city of Copenhagen. They are, they have a very ambitious sustainable food strategy that pays in their sustainable I don't know, climate change strategy. So we try a lot of those nudges, small and larger nudges to make people kind of, um, well, first of all, um, drop, diminish uh, food waste, and second, also reduce their meat consumption. And this is done within the city um, and, and different, different places, intervention places like canteens and festivals. And yeah, so maybe one of these days I can report it whether it worked. Now, these were the tools, but there has been and still is and rightly is a lot of debate about, you know, when and how ethical is it and how acceptable is the use of nudges. So uh, my co-author, uh, Cass Sunstein, and I came up with, based on, uh, on empirical work, on something that he calls a bill of rights for nudging. And what do we mean? It is utmost of the utmost important that actually the ends are legitimate. So this is only about welfare enhancing nudges and not about anything else. So when you talk, hear talk about dark nudges, this is definitely not what uh, you know, policy is in any way um, allowed to do, including manipulation. So um, also the respect for individual rights. So this is about being means paternalistic but not about the end. So it should be, it must be freedom preserving in the very end. Um, it must be consistent with people's values and interests. And we looked at, in this little book, we looked at 15 different countries and a long list of different nudges. And we found that the majority is actually supported and approved the use of nudges when done in a responsible way. I already said, it, you know, there's no way to manipulate people. Um, it should be transparent, both the tools and also the process rather than hidden. And that means subject to public debate and scrutiny. If it fits, it doesn't always fit, but including the nudges in a participative process, something that has been called nudge plus, is highly recommended, particular when we talk about more intrusive nudges that kind of helps, um, well, creates, creates uh, motivation, creates trust 
And also very often simply makes the, mud, the nudge uh, more effective. Yes, so nudges, of course, must be effective, cost effective, and uh, if you want the benefits must be larger than the costs, um, including all those unintended side effects um, that might might happen. So, and there's probably more. I think these are the most important things, and they have been um, also included in those nice things like basic or other um, kind of schemes that help policymakers in a very practical manner how to go about um, designing such behavioral tools. And um, I, just to share with this, of course, we cannot go here into any detail, but I think where we're now, because I said in the beginning, we're um, luckily not starting with that, but we have been in the field for at least 15 years. And so what we see now, this is an example uh, from my own lab, is overview studies, systematic maps. This is a systematic map, systematic reviews, meta-analysis. People also now work with uh, machine learning and like with big data, data mining, to create a sense of what is the level of evidence we actually have as regards, in this case, behavioral um, tools um, trying to uh, do exactly what I just mentioned with the, in this uh, example with the city of Copenhagen, so reducing animal protein and reducing food waste. And we see that uh, uh, similar studies in many different consumption areas, which I think is a very good sign because it doesn't only show that the field is a lot is going on and more and more people are interested, but also kind of it consolidates uh, one or the other question that we might still want to revisit, but we need some a, a good evidence base in order to really be able to consult policy. This is another one, uh, which is not from my lab, but from a colleague here from Cambridge, and she looked at something very interesting, something we know only a little bit about which is how do we best combine behavioral tools with non-behavioral tools? In this case, she looked at taxes and subsidies. So how do pricing and behavioral instruments best work together? And this is definitely an area where we don't know enough and more work is uh, highly welcome. Okay, so this is my last slide, and I know kind of from a pedagogical view, it's much too full. Um, I still kind of uh, would like to share this with you. Um, so yeah, I think we know today that they can be very effective. They can sometimes be more effective than hard instruments. However, we still have to kind of go on and get more evidence and also look at, you know, always re remember that it's highly context dependent. This is why we always, we still have to test, learn, adapt and share the results probably for a long while. Now, um, also an, a second point is that if we only focus on individuals' behaviors, there is one of those big risks, which is overcompensation with, by rebound effects. So while I'm also kind of, you know, my field and a lot of the practical work I do is really focused on individual or group behavior change, uh, systemic change is absolutely needed. So without that level of change without good regulation, without good taxes, without hard regulation, without carbon prices, we're not going to go there. We're not going to nudge to zero. Um, I think we also know today that there are only a very few universal laws, um, so we have to keep on testing. Um, most existing demand side policies are soft and not behaviorally informed. So what I said, factor in the behavioral factor, we should do that. We can learn a lot from it and make existing policies better. And also one thing that I that I kind of realized is that behavioral scientists have played a very little role in, in, in some major technical science policy interfaces until recently. And I think it's pretty good that, um, you know, that this is about to change, that behavioral science and also with the network that you are a part of and that the UN and Mary is, is, is organizing and leading, that will hopefully really change. And I think there's a good reason why um, behavioral science is now part of this quintet of change. 
Right. Um, I think I'll stop here. This is what I wanted to share with you. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much, Lucia. It's very helpful. We're seeing a lot of comments come through the chat and a very insightful presentation, very interesting presentation. So um, questions have already come through. We'll get to them after our discussion with the next speaker. Um, so thank you very much. And um, now over to Mari from UNEP. Hello, sorry, just a bit of. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Um, my name is Marie Nishimura, as introduced, and I'm so happy to be here and listening to Alicia's presentation, which is so important and actually has such a good uh, introduction before my presentation as well. Um, UNEP's been uh, working to get universities to um, commit to net zero um, emissions and rethinking curriculum, but um, the greatest contribution they can make are, are the, the choices that they make on each, each day uh, for the rest of their lives. So we published a quick guide uh, to reducing uh, campus environmental impacts through behavioral change. Uh, the book has 14 RGs um, ranging from recycling, um, sustainable diets and reducing food waste and travel. And this is our first on behavioral science and nudge theory, which focused on um, human actions. Um, before publishing, um, we worked with behavioral specialists and um, also studied 46 universities in the world uh, with nudge already in place. Um, we're so excited to, to be able to call 141 universities our pilot campuses to actually use that book on their campuses. Um, I'd like to show a quick video just to give you an overview of this book. <music> So I want to do um, a little exercise with you. I'll just give you 10 seconds to remember this uh, slide. Right, so, I mean, feel free to write that in the chat box as well, but do you, what, what words are you, do you recall? Do you remember snore? Do you remember wake? Do you remember blanket? Does anyone remember sleep? Okay, actually there was no sleep there. But don't worry, actually 40 to 50% of people falsely remember there was sleep in this list. 
And that's because simply we're not hyper rational. We rely on automatic thinking and we have limited attention to use shortcuts. And of course, memory simply always influence uh, our, uh, sorry, the contextual um, power uh, always influences uh, our memory. You know, we wrongly remember things. What's Najes? Um, it's defined as positive and gentle persuasion to influence behavior and decisions and how they used, um, um, I think Lucia already um, mentioned EAST framework um, by Behavioral Insights Team, and I really like that feast uh, message there. Uh, so easy, uh, make it easy, for example, default setting. Um, you know, instead of telling people not to use plastic straws, what if it's they're given no plastic straws or just paper straws uh, by default, then you can actually significantly reduce the number of uh, straw use. Or make it attractive, you know, putting the signage um, um, to make it fun or gamifying, um, you know, littering properly or recycling. And make it social. It's not like on Wednesday we wear pink, um, not that kind of thing, but, you know, um, you might find yourself shopping this weekend for Christmas just because your friends are uh, shopping, uh, even though you didn't intend to. And timely, um, you know, when students are enrolled in universities and if they're staying in, in the dorm dormitory, maybe that's probably the, uh, you know, a good timing for them to, to have intervention on how they use water or, or energy. Why is this important? Um, we have, We have today uh, roughly 220 million students enrolled in higher education, and most of them are called Generation Z. And their consumer powers is actually more than the annual cost of meeting the SDG targets 6.2 and 6.3, which are about water hygiene, drinking water, and um, sanitary. And uh, robust scientists uh, um, actually show the study shows that the green light is actually a really powerful tool to shift the behavior. And we're so happy actually to share, um, have this actually featured on CNN. And if possible, I would like to share that with you. Like the Kedge Business School in Marseille. We started implementing our first Natchez about five years ago. What we learned is that a little nudging takes people a long way. Kedge started small, with little signs and brighter recycling bins. But soon, they looked towards an even tinier source of problems. One cigarette butt pollutes about 500 liters of water every year. There were regular ashtrays, but people would still stomp out their cigarette butts on the floor. So they gave the ashtrays a makeover. They're brightly yellow, so you can't miss them. And position them better. In strategic areas where people go for smoking. But most importantly, they started asking questions. People drop uh, their cigarette in the, the area that corresponds to uh, their answer. Making it fun has really made a difference. Really? We collect every year 200,000 cigarette butts, both on our Marseille campus and our Bordeaux campus. Those butts get properly recycled and that allows us to preserve the equivalent of 40 Olympic size swimming pools in fresh water. The school also increased composting when campus was fully open pre-COVID by nudging students to separate their cafeteria waste. Anya says this simple switch created 1.8 metric tons of compost a year, which went directly back into the gardens. Sometimes it's difficult for people to play their active role because it's inconvenient or it's not at the right time, it's not at the right place. So more it's fun and more it's easy to act sustainably, people will act. Right now, nearly 120 universities across the world are piloting the UN's green nudges. And if these students personally pick up sustainable habits, imagine the impacts that could have on the places they go on to work. Sleep is the elixir of life.
excuse me, I didn't mean to uh, present on the sleep to prevent um, deprive. Um, I hope nobody's having a, that problem. Uh, anyway, um, so we're in uh, phase two at the moment and trying to select two to three universities in each region uh, who are already capable to measure the actual impacts of green nudges. Um, it could be three to 10 months and it's really depend on what university can and wants to do. And we're, we're going to closely monitor um, the progress of how they're going to um, you know, implement green nudges. So there'll be control group and a different group um, by, for example, installing um, a smart meter or equip, um, using a basketball uh, net over trash can just to see if that works better to, you know, uh, incentivize people to do more recycling than without it. Um, so if you're interested, and I would love to have that um, Lucia's um, universities present um, joining this um, from Cambridge, uh, please uh, contact us or take a look at our website here at, at the bottom there. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mari. Um, very interesting presentation as well in terms of um, some actual examples of payroll science application university campuses. So if you would like to leave your camera on, Mari, maybe we can have a go through the questions together. Um, so I think some of them relate to, to both of your presentations. So um, I will not use my privilege as chair given our time to ask a question, although I have many questions to ask. Uh, we'll go to the first question from uh, an anonymous attendee. Um, specifically, it's about present bias and climate change issues. Uh, what are some examples in this area to perhaps speak to? See, I know you mentioned that in your presentation, and Mari, I know perhaps some of the examples in the Little Green Book of Nudges might touch upon present bias. So thoughts on that in particular would be appreciated. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah maybe, maybe one example of a study that I don't know, was, was effective. Um, it's important to make the future visible to kind of make it relevant, to bring the future closer to today. So what those people did, which I thought was really cool, they had, uh, they, they showed the subjects how they would look like in, you know, 10 years, 30 years. I don't know whether that's really fun, but the idea is to kind of put the subjects in the position of, you know, in the future. And that kind of changes, um, uh, it, it changes the, yeah, the evaluation of the situation. So kind of, because this is so difficult to do that in an abstract way. I mean, you know, we could kind of make it a system two thing, but kind of really changing our own picture, kind of looking at ourselves in 20 years from now, or maybe, you know, like 2050 would probably be a, a pretty good, a pretty good date because of all the, the climate goals. That obviously did something. So people would respond differently to, uh, to different queries. So may I making the future visible? And uh, I, I, ha I haven't seen a study, but I would like to do a study with kind of in the metaverse, um, because I think also with, uh, you know, using those technologies, it can be probably can be very kind of realistic to put yourself in a later place, in a later stage. So. If and I, what I saw is that we'll be able to visit kind of the future in the metaverse. So maybe we can, I mean, can kind of harness on on those wonderful opportunities. I maybe someone is already doing it. I'm I'm not aware of it. Very helpful, Lucia. Yeah, I think so. I'm I'm trying to be short because there are so many questions. I mean, I I could go on, but no, that's I think there are more questions. Of course, no, it's really good. I think I've seen that also in the space of financial savings, thinking about the future and the present bias as well, and giving people what they would look like closer to retirement age as well. So it's very interesting about different domains and how some of these behavioral science principles might be relevant in different areas. I don't know, Mari, did you have any thoughts with respect to the Little Green Book of Nudges? Yes, definitely, definitely. I think uh, in the past we thought, you know, uh, the climate discussions or it's actually done behind. Uh, in, in COP, for example, it's, everything is done behind a wall and it's not relevant to, to me or something like this, you know. But as soon as um, we change the messages about, you know, 
what you're envisioning, what, what's your inspiration, what's your what would you aspire to? Um, and I think some of the strategy that Lucia um, listed was the strategy that are all positive. And I think fear and scare type of uh, communication is, is already outdated. It wasn't effective, um, not effective enough. But changing that message is more positive um, and connected to their aspiration in, for the future is quite effective, I think. And, and you know, you can actually see um, more um, climate, climate marches and making sustainable lifestyles really cool which wasn't cool before, but you know, there's definitely a great positive social movement there already in that I would say that yeah, is a good um, example. Great, thanks for that Mario as well. Very, very interesting examples when it comes to um, the, bigger, the bigger picture too. Um, okay, so we have a number of questions. I was wondering if you'd like to ask your question yourself. I know Sanya, you have a few here. I can give you the floor to talk um, now if you'd like to ask it. Please do. If not, I can ask your question for you. No? Okay, that's fine. Then I can I can ask your question for you. Um, so you had, you had a few questions here, actually. So one was about, um, do you have recommendations regarding public debates on behavioral on, on, in broad and general sense? Um, they're hard to implement in practice. So how do we go from the public discussion down to the actual talking about behavior? So how do you make that linkage? Um, and she also had a question about systems change too, and how do you make it systems level? So thinking, I guess, from the bigger picture through to the behaviors, how do we make that, that connection? So I guess, Mari, you touched upon that a little bit, but you could both expand a bit more on, on your thinking there. Yes. Um... Right. Uh, so this this is the idea of um, what is sometimes called nudge plus. So you know, get 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 the public involved um, because they are usually the experts of their own life, and they usually often know exactly where the real barriers are. Um, and because everything is so setting specific and problem specific, it, I mean, simply for making it more effective, it makes makes a lot of sense. But also in the sense of getting their involvement and buy-in and, and legitimacy, it makes a lot of sense. But absolutely right, it, this is not something that happens automatically. It has to be planned. And if you do it from a practical side, it has to be actually budgeted. And a lot of thought has to be put into um, such, such schemes um, that they are really helpful and not just kind of cheap talk or kind of, you know, pacifiers in the sense of, yeah, we heard the public. So maybe, maybe two, two ideas how to do that. Um, in, back in, in Germany, I helped with a citizens conference that was going on about you know, like almost almost six months uh, in, in over the summer, uh, specifically on sustainable consumption. So there were 100 average citizens, whoever that is, um, um, kind of re more or less representing uh, the German population. And there were several rounds with experts and yeah, kind of different, diff diff different, uh, different uh, setups. Um, and uh, we also discussed uh, whether and which ones of those behavioral insights, uh, behavioral insight based tools would be acceptable. And so, but this is kind of, it's a lot of, I mean, it's effortful, it takes time and it's expensive. A kind of a shortcut is something we do in our uh, Copenhagen project which is we have a panel of a hundred, again, kind of, you know, average um, and inhabitants uh, of Copenhagen. And they kind of, they, they accompany us through this Fourier project. So like more or less a talk, we can use them either as kind of as references or as a kind of, you know, an echo chamber. We can ask them about things they can. So this is kind of a, um, an accompanying um, panel um, that of, of citizens who again are experts in their own city, but also become after a while kind of I get a good understanding of those what behavioral insights can do and what they cannot do. So I think my point is it is it's not that easy. <laughs> but uh, it's absolutely important to do. And then of course, on a more general line, but I think that's not, that's pretty much undisputed. It, 
at least in democratic societies, um, nothing should happen secretly behind parliament or government doors. Um, it should be open, I mean, open even in the simple sense, like put on a website and you invite people for a, an online talk. I mean, that's, that's kind of the minimum. The second question um, was on systems change. Yes, so I'm, you know, I sometimes kind of um, people say, well, do you really believe that you can hold climate change with nudges? And I say, of course not, because that is uh, focusing on the individual level. The big changes, as I said, like carbon prices or the right forms of regulation or getting rid of those inefficient subsidies or taxing things that are not taxed because they are in tax havens and, and, and. So the whole system of, of the different systems absolutely definitely have to, have to change. And maybe also to make it more concrete, like over this year, there was this uh, UN food systems change um, process. And in September, the UN food systems summit uh, actually in New York. And the focus of this was really on food systems. So what are the types of food that are produced? What are the, the type of agriculture food comes from? How, do, how are subsidies and taxes? Um, I mean, what, what do they actually incentivize? Which type of agriculture is out there? And what do we need in order to get more sustainable? So these are big questions and they have to, you know, I, I don't like this game of what is first. I think both has to go to go together because just changing the system without factoring in the human factor will also not work. Very, very helpful and comprehensive responses. Um, Mari, do you have some reflections as well you'd like to share? Well, I think uh, Lucia really summarized much better than I could even you know, prepare for hours <laughs> for it. Um, but I think maybe quickly um, for public debates, um, yeah, it's probably, I'm not expert in this, so I'm not sure if I could give you uh, any recommendation or in the right place to do so. But um, if it, I think it could be done at much smaller scale, like in universities as well, you know, on campus instead of in the city or, or a national level. And I think that's a really good practice to actually visit different perspectives that you don't normally represent personally. So this is a good practice to widen uh, perspectives um, uh, to me. Uh, for the second question, um, I think it requires uh, skills in empathy as well as um, you know sharing um, the values and cultures and building relationship across different sectors uh, within the community. And that's the um, you know, capabilities that are needed for system change. Um, because everyone is individual, you know, everything, all the environmental issues and climate issues, everything comes down to individual actions, whether as a consumer or as a producer or as a policy makers. So, well, <laughs> I think skills and empathy is really, really important to me. That's a, that's a very good point and that underscores a lot of a lot of work in behavioral science in general um so great thank you for that mari as well um okay so moving along through the questions here um i see one from in the chat which is not supposed to happen but there's one about um is nudge age dependent so it'd be interesting to think mari what you think about the university age students compared to others but building upon that we also have a question from a deal that touches upon this too i can give you the floor if you'd like to ask your your questions if not, I can ask them for you. Uh, I don't mind asking the question. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Great. Please go ahead. Um, so my first question was just on the intention version versus um, action gap, which is a significant problem in like multiple different areas, but specifically when regarding climate action and sustainable practices. Is there any uh, evidence or suggestions that you have um, uh, Lucia, uh, regarding how um, researchers have suggested to overcome this issue. Yes, thanks. Thanks for it's an excellent question. Um, the point is that 
often particular policymakers see it as you know this is this is kind of a mistake um, of people's behavior there is a that intentions and behaviors are not the same i must say from a researcher's perspective i'm not surprised at all that is more kind of the normal this is what we do all the time so we should also expect that to be uh, to to be you know to be seen in sustainable behavior so this is this is just how humans are um because we do have our ideals this is what we really want to do and then there is reality uh, so what i want to say is you know, on, on the one hand i think this is a little bit overrated of course this is an empirical result that we find all the time but it's pretty normal i mean just if you don't think of consumers as icons but as humans this is exactly what this is about and the solution is also exactly try to narrow it, it by make it even make it even easier make it even more the social norm make it even what your friends or the group you want to be with or you want to be like actually does so these are those little kind of really those little nudges that hopefully you kind know, of that tend to 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 kind of minimize or at least diminish that that action that gap um yeah thank you great um so th thank you very helpful for that question and for the answer this year i think adil and also ramesh had this comment about um our, our nudges age dependent and adil also had a comment regarding um do you know whether the nudges are being converted into behaviors that are continued at the home in the longer term? So the sustainability of these nudges that you're doing as well. So thinking about the different groups and kind of the long-term impacts of, of nudging in the space, what your, your thoughts are on that, particularly Mari, would be helpful and Lucia as well. Yes. Should, should I start, Mary, and then you you, you join in? Okay. Um, yeah, so it is it's actually quite surprising. So the at least based on the literature that I know, and as I said, there's now more and more systematic overviews. This whole thing of social demographics that we as consumer researchers are so much used to to look at and to have our results, it's comparatively small. So also age is, I mean, yes, there are sometimes um, effects, but it's not, I would say it's not a big thing. However, what we know very, very little, very, very little on uh, about children and uh, teenagers. So I just talked to, I was in another talk uh, last week uh, with a psychologist who's actually studying children and teenagers. And we decided we have to change that because there's so little. And I mean, this is also why the work of uh, Mavi and the UNEP is so important. I mean, if you want to change people's behavior, everyone knows start early. And if you want to change uh, society, I mean, you have to, you have to start at uh, probably at kindergarten and then continue at least until uh, university. So the answer is uh, we, what we know shows that the typical social demographics are not, except for gender. So gender is a factor. Uh, but all the rest, like education, um, it, you know, in, in one or the other study, it does have an effect, but generally it's much smaller. So it's not like, I don't know, like framing works better for a younger cohort and defaults works better for older ones. Um, that's not, that's, uh, that, that's not the case. The second question was about the sustainability of the effectiveness of nudges, if I got you right. And this is, again, a field where we do not know a lot. So, I mean, hope that's that's also good news for us researchers or for you researchers. There is still a lot to, to find out. Uh, we know a little bit, and it seems to be that when those nudges like defaults are not like one-off um, changes or stimuli, but more in the sense of nudges that really change the choice architecture and is there to stay at least for a while so that habits can form and can change so that dynamic norms, so these are new norms, have time to kind of settle down and to spread out, then they tend to, to stick. If not, a lot of those one of, I mean, we know that ourselves, right? like, like reminders or, that they might work once or twice, but then it's like, you know, get rid of them. Uh, um, 
uh, so it's it depends again, but this is definitely a, a field where we um, have to know more. By the way, um, it's not so different from the other policies. So, I mean, what about the sustainability of information? You know, people forget, and there's there's counter information. What about the sustainability of taxes? I mean, when they're relieved, what what does that mean? Are they very often behavior changes back? So, it's nothing that is specific to behavioral instruments. Okay, um, then I'll answer uh, two questions quickly um, about uh, converting uh, uh, sustainable behaviors beyond universities. Um, I believe there is, I'm not sure if there's an evidence to it. And as Lucia said, that's why it's, we're gracious for researchers. Uh, but we find we think that higher education is a perfect petri dish to explore um, how to influence habits and behaviors and university really represents a key timely moment for intervention because students are establishing habits and routines and new ones in many aspects of their lives because they're probably living alone for the first time away from the family. So even though, yes, uh, I absolutely agree that it has to start with younger age, you know, I mean, you start, you know that you have to say thank you to people when somebody is kind to you. But you don't know why, but that's your habit, you know, it's your your embedded into it because that's how you're raised. Um, so it's it's naturally in you already. But when it comes to um you know value and what you want and you know how you're influenced influenced by surround people surrounding you, it's it's just you need to actually find your own value. And when you do that actually you carry that beyond a university because that's the first step you're actually independent um, about the age um, we pick those 14 edges because they are actually really general for and accessible and i think find it resonant to as many universities as possible if you find um, but we need to tailor it uh, whether this is age group or um, country um, or even a sector. So those 14 nudges are actually for universities and we re received uh, lots of requests from different sectors like music associations and you know we have different um, nudges that are best for them and as a, um, you know when I was in junior high I remember everyone was using plastic bottles but I've never seen I have never seen my grandmother using plastic bottles when we go on a short trip you know so we don't actually need to nudge them about plastic bottles to those age group. So I think uh, nudges can be tailored and should be tailored to um, the right target audience. Great, thank you for that both. I think the really interesting comments there and things that have echoed across some of the other work I think about behavioral science in the UN system. So this idea of a fresh start, you know, a new beginning, you're when you start to build these habits and new ways of working. We talk about that a lot, well, that could be the new school year, it could be moving to new city, it could be all these like university presents many options for that many opportunities for that, excuse me. And also this idea of habit theory, not just in one time action, behavioral science can be helpful for people to doing, filling out a form or for signing up for something, but it's also how do we build habits? How do we, there's a whole other science and way of thinking around that. And it's very interesting to think about how these nudges can, can not only can help allow people to do it once, but also throughout their lives and really instill it in their behaviors. Um, I see.